let me quickly introduce you to our speaker uh, who got a, a paying gig uh, after he had already um, committed to, to talking to us. And instead of canceling the Launchpad gig, he is now speaking to us from Boston. So we're very, we're very excited to have him. So John Gates is our speaker and we have a larger than normal attendance today. And I'm sure that's because of the notoriety of John and the topic. Uh, he is a pay negotiation coach at Salary Coach Academy. Uh, he's going to be talking to you about the topic, Unlock the Secrets of Safe Salary Negotiation, uh, with career titles like Head of Global Recruitment for multiple Fortune 500 companies. John has spent 30 years on the other side of the negotiating table training recruiters on how to negotiate with you. He's been responsible for over 75,000 offer negotiations in his career. He knows what recruiters and interviewers are thinking as they ask you questions about compensation. He can safely guide you to the best possible pay package with minimal risk. Uh, he has a website that I'm sure is gonna be put into the chat for you to, to connect with him. And uh, without any more delay, let us give a very warm welcome to John Gates. Welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate the kind introduction, Kathy. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Am I good on volume? Okay, yes, great. You're perfect. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. We'll get off uh, with a presentation. So I'm going to be talking about what I do and giving you some salary negotiation tips along the way. I'm not surprised that this is a popular session because how to make more money, especially when you're in the job hunt, is something that's on everyone's mind. And when you're in the job hunt, sometimes you feel like you're victimized by the process. You're not sure how to handle these conversations. And uh, that's why I started Salary Coach as a consulting practice, as a coaching practice to help job seekers to navigate the minefield of pay discussions along the way. Being that guy on the other side of the negotiating table for so many years, um, I noticed that at least 70% of the people that I was hiring, my colleagues who were hiring, my team was hiring, 70% of people at least were leaving money on the table. And sometimes they didn't realize how much they were leaving behind. It could be $5,000 or it could be $50,000. It just depends on the situation. I could tell you some very, very specific stories about how um, candidates left money on the table when they could have gotten it with a few simple questions. But I've come to realize and, and discover along the way that candidates take a very conservative approach to salary discussions. Often it's out of fear. It's because when you're being phone phone interviewed or phone screened, you're worried if you give a number that's too high, you'll be screened out. You won't get a chance to interview or meet the hiring manager or their team at all. And that happens all the time, actually. People get screened out at that step based on the salary discussion and how it was handled. Uh, they're afraid, even worse, that they might lose the, the job offer at the end. They'll be made an offer. They try to negotiate that offer. It gets yanked out from under you. That's a really disastrous outcome. So who is this John Gates guy? <laughs> As Kathy mentioned, I've been the guy on the other side of the negotiating table for 30 years. And so I know how the salary discussions come forward. I know I've seen candidates make those disastrous mistakes over and over again. And it's not surprising to me that they make them because most people go through salary negotiation process a handful of times in their lifetime. You guys are beginners maybe at this process and the recruiters and, and hiring people on the other end are experts because they've been doing it over and over again. So you, you start with an unlevel playing field. So I'm here to help dispel some of that. I hope that as you have questions, like I'm gonna give some presentation, I hope it'll put you all to sleep hope that the subject will be exciting enough 
to be to be compelling and interesting and you'll learn some things but if you have questions and i'm sure you will even if it's about your own situation write that stuff down there's going to be q a opportunities throughout the presentation and i'm going to ask you to give me feedback along the way in the chat if you would so let's see i gotta get into my slideshow here and make sure that i can advance the slides all right, so I just want to check in and see who's here. If you could go into the chat and give a one, two, three, or four kind of to give me an, a, a basic understanding of who the audience is, because then if most people are in a certain group, I can shift the the level of conversation up or down, kind of depending on what, what you might need. So take a sec, put that in the chat. And uh, I'll ask Kathy to take a peek in there and kind of. Okay. I, I see a three. I see a one, two, four, three, four, two, four, one. We're all over the map. Okay. All four, over the map. Another four. Another three to four. All right. It sounds like maybe salaried is most of the, most of the group, even maybe angling up toward the senior level. And that's good. Yeah. It's supposed um, to be three. Another four. Most, I'd say most of my coaching clients are in the three and four group, but what I'm going to say probably applies to most groups. I think being paid by the hour is a bit challenging because the ranges are fairly tight. And so the opportunity to get more uh, is, is limited. I just took on a new coaching client who has a significant comp package, like pushing seven figures. And I think that client is probably going to end up with a uh, one to two hundred thousand dollar increase in the pay package uh, after working with me. So let's go on. All right, now let's ask this next question: Where do you personally feel the most stress in talking about money in the job search? Is it that pesky question in the application? What's your salary requirement? Is it in the first screening call? Is it in interviews? Or is it at the finish line when you're trying to decide if you're going to make a counter offer? Okay, we've got four, four, three, four, two, four, one, three, four, three, four. All right. One. <laughs> all right, four. kind of all over the place. I heard a lot. But mostly, mostly four and three, four, and here's a one, four. Split, <laughs> like bowling. Yeah, a split. Yeah, three, I could, I could uh, talk about every one of these steps, but I'd need a lot more time than an hour probably to do that. So I might zero in a little bit maybe at the um, offer, counter offer stage and see if that makes some sense to spend some time there. But do write down your questions. If you have specific questions, I can nail them uh, in the Q&A segment. Don, if I can interject really quickly, because yeah. we are in the capital of the state, um, mm -hmm. when people do you know, make those applications, they definitely you know, have to put down their, their salary. So um, just, just as, a, as a possible, like if you can just touch on number one, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. Well, let me let me just back up and do that right now, uh, because there is kind of an an there's an this drives everybody crazy because you don't want to lowball yourself, but you don't want to put something too high in this box. And most applications will require you to put in a number. Some will some will ask you to pick ranges from a drop down. Some will actually be a free text field where you can put in text. But for now, let's just talk about what number to put in there. You're going to have a range of possibility that you're comfortable with. And here's the trick. You want to put something on the low side in here because the recruiter on the other end is, is this is a primary screening question. Recruiters are extremely busy. If you're applying to a company that has an HR person or recruiter that screens all the applications, sometimes they're responsible for 30, 40 open positions. And if that's true, they have less than an hour a week to think about who they're going to talk to 
and even less time than that to actually talk to people. So they have to narrow the field pretty quick. And this is a primary field narrower. So if you put a low number in there, aren't you low lowballing yourself? Uh, yes, but you can recover from that in the phone screen. You have one chance to re to reset that once the phone rings, and that's in that phone screening call. So the strategy here is put a lowish number in the application in an attempt to get that call. And then when you're on the call, of course, you have to write that number down. You have to remember what you put in every application. So have a way of doing that in that call. When you get that call and the, the question of pay comes up, this is your chance to reset the, the number. And you should reset it into a range. Okay, so let's say you put in a number that's 140,000. What's your salary requirement? 140,000. All right, put that in there. Then when the phone when the phone rings, somebody's asking you, let's talk about pay again. I just want to make sure this is okay. Then you can say, you know what? I put 140,000 in there, but I'm not at all familiar with the requirements of the job yet. I wanted to tell you what I'm discussing with other companies. It's actually quite a broad range and I want to include my total compensation figure in there. 140 is, is an estimate of base salary, but this is all a range, of course. So I'm talking to other companies and I'm really looking at a range that's actually between 140 and uh, you know maybe low twos even. For that you can have a really broad range at this stage, but the best thing to do is to shift into total compensation. So you want the number to include bonuses, stock, if there's any stock or anything like basically base plus incentives. So my base salary might be in the range of 140, but my total pay expectation would be somewhere in the 170 to 240 range, somewhere in there. That's what I'm discussing with other companies. This is a good opportunity then to segue into, tell me about your bonus plan. Do you have one or is it all salary? You need to understand how this fits. So there, you put a number in the application to get the call. And then on the call, you do something that I call reframing. You reframe into a range. And that range can be quite broad. And if the recruiter pushes back, it says, well, gee, that's a very, very broad range. Sorry. I'm in a conference room that thinks I'm gone if I sit too long. <laughs> so, yeah, if they push back and they say, well, that's a really super broad range. Can you narrow that down for me? You could say, well, I'd be happy to narrow it down for you once I've had a more substantial conversation with the hiring team and I understand the job a little bit more and the challenges and also the value that I would bring. And you can offer to narrow it a little bit if they seem really broad, but really a screener, somebody who's screening candidates and trying to decide who's going to interview, they ask for numbers often because they want to just plot a point on a scale. They want to know, are you fitting into the range that they have that they know is realistic? And most of the time they do have a range and they know what they can screen out or they wouldn't be having a screening call. So they... Um, if you're giving them a range, what they're really looking for here is overlap between your range and their range. If you toss a range out there, you can actually ask them, how does my range fit with your range? Am, am I low in your range? Is it kind of in the middle? Uh, am I coming in toward the top of your range? Where does that sit? And uh, this is a good way of, of testing whether or not you're you're over the top. So I hope that that might answer actually a little bit of one and two. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and move on. Let's ask another quick question of the group. When does negotiation begin? One, two, three, or four. One, one, four, one. 
<clears throat> two. The little all over two. the place, a lot of people in the Four. application. Four, two, <laughs> one, two, one. Yep. I actually get into arguments a little bit with, with career coaches and other people. Even, even candidates often believe that the negotiation starts when there's an offer. When they're actually putting numbers in front of you, that's when you begin to negotiate. Um, I have a slightly different perspective on that. Technically, that might be true where you are you begin the give and take process maybe at that point. But I get calls sometimes. I get candidates um, calling me. They haven't been working with me through the whole process. Instead, they call me at the finish line and say, John, I just got a low ball offer and I'm going to take it whether or not it can be improved. But it's 30 percent low. I have to take something. I'm about ready to run out of unemployment or savings or something. Can you help me to recover? And the answer is yes. I can help them to recover some. But the negotiation negotiation is a process in my mind, not an event. And the process of negotiation, I think, starts from the very first time they ask you for some numbers, and that's in the application. So you start positioning there, you reposition in the phone screen, you're building value in interviews. And so very often people who get lowball offers have made mistakes in the application screening or interview phase. So we can try to recover from those mistakes, but <clears throat> After you finish interviewing, there's usually a meeting that happens between HR, the hiring manager. They want to hire somebody. They've selected you. And that meeting goes something like this. I know because I've sat in thousands of them. The HR person will show up to the meeting and say, hey, who do you want to hire? And they say, I want to hire Mary. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Tell me why you want to hire Mary. And there's a discussion about it to make sure it's the right pick. And then um, the recruiter might say, or the HR person might say, all right, here's what I think it's going to take to get Mary. What do you think? And there's a discussion. There's a debate sometimes. And often even somebody from the compensation function is in there or an HR generalist. It could be a group of people deciding what's reasonable to offer you. <clears throat> So that perception of what's going to be offered is built way before the offer stage actually comes. <clears throat> you need to be influencing that number all through the process. And then, so you're not in that meeting, you can't directly influence right then, but you need to set the stage with the hiring manager, you need to set the stage with the HR person. So they think it's gonna take a little more maybe to interest you or close you at this point. And there's a careful dance and a careful maneuver that you're doing through all of these steps and stages to influence. But once they settle on a number, they're going to put that on a form and it's going to route to a bunch of approvers. It's probably going to go to the hiring manager, their boss, maybe their boss's boss, depending on what it is. Uh, and what position it is. Sometimes it goes to HR, a person who's never even met you, and all these people are going to challenge those numbers. This is why it's difficult at the offer stage, if you're 30% low, to get into a whole new bracket is tough. Like, if somebody has is, is offering you a Volkswagen Super Beetle at the offer stage, I can help you to paint it a new color but I'm probably not going to transform it into a Mercedes at that point. You missed the window. So I hope that helps you to understand that you got to be talking effectively about pay through this whole process in order to get a good offer. And there is a negotiation at the offer stage, oftentimes. And we'll talk about that since that was really popular. I'll, I'll hit uh, offer stage uh, as, as time goes on here. All right, so I, I actually asked this question uh, at LinkedIn not too long ago, and this is what the LinkedIn group of people said. 
uh, all over the place, just like this group. Most people have been following, you know, they, they follow my polls, but they follow my content on LinkedIn and recognize that it was in the application probably where the negotiation process begins. <laughs> All right. So nine principles of negotiation. These are things that I hammer on a lot in my site, uh, which, by the way, is salarycoachacademy.com. I have a website there and access to a members area that has video lessons on how to navigate every single step of the salary negotiation process. I also coach people one-on-one. -on -one. But here are these uh, basic nine principles. I probably should come up with one more because it would be an even 10, but here's nine. <clears throat> Principle number one is to keep your job search pipeline full. What I might mean by that is be applying, be networking, be interviewing, because competition is a huge point of leverage in negotiating. If you show up to interviews with nothing else in your basket, then you, you feel in your gut that you're a little bit desperate and they can smell that. This is going to lead to lack of leverage in negotiating your pay. So doing the work, putting in the work, never, never bringing your foot up off the gas, always have something in your pipeline, always have an interview that's happening next week or a phone call that's going to happen next week. This is going to help you emotionally, but it definitely helps you at the, uh, at the offer table. Next thing is don't get fixated on salary. This happens to a lot of people when they, when they're asked about compensation, they talk about the salary that they want. Make a shift into total compensation because every company has a different philosophy, how much incentive there's going to be relative to base salary. And if you tell them you need a $150,000 base salary, when in fact, they're going to offer $130,000, but they're going to have an 80% incentive on top of that, they might screen you out. So... Be careful getting too fixated on salary and shift as soon as you can into total compensation. Research your value. So this means kind of do some research and understand what's the basic range that you're looking for and fishing in. But the best information here is not going to be from Indeed or LinkedIn or salary.com or other salary survey sites. The best information you'll have on your value is what actual companies would offer you in today's market. So as you're going through phone screens, you're going to want to gather up what is a realistic range for the position you're discussing. They think you're a fit or they wouldn't have called you. And so this is going to give you that range that you're discussing with other, other employers that you need to throw out there in all your phone screens. All right. We talked about this a little bit. Always use a range, never a number. In the phone screen, when they ask you for a number, give them a range. Because if you give them a number, it's never, here's, here's what it is. It's always too high or too low. It's almost never exactly right. So you can put a number out there that's too high, but in a phone screen, you haven't interviewed yet. and They don't really know what you're worth yet. You, have, you don't have that leverage to ask for a high number yet. That's why you want to give them a range and then work up in the range as you go through. If you give them a number that's too low because you want to get the interview, it's really hard to, it's hard to adjust from that number later. Like I said, you're going to give them that number that's low to get the interview. And then when they have that post interview selection meeting that I already talked about, they're gonna think they can land you for that. This is why you need to give them a range in the phone screen. All right, avoid ultimatums. So I've seen a lot of content on LinkedIn and in other places where people chime in and they say, well, this works for me. I always just tell them I need $300,000 or that's it, I'm walking. And they, they say that when a recruiter calls them and asks them if they're interested. Like I mentioned, you haven't proven that you're worth 300000 yet. And that happens in the interview. So 
sometimes people think this works for them. And so that's what they do, but this doesn't work for most people. So be careful. Use interviews to prove your value. So mentioned before, you got to knock it out of the park in the interview, but here's, here's the secret for interview. Most people are just going to wait for the interview questions to come at them. They're going to answer the interview questions, and they think that if they answer them well, they're acing the interview. Here's what's going to help you to be most valuable. In that Q&A time at the end of an interview, when they're asking you, when they're asking you questions or they, they ask if you have any questions for them, sometimes people waste this time asking about a day in the life or curiosity based questions that you could get answered later. Try to avoid that. Instead, use this time to figure out what their biggest fears are or their biggest ambitions relating to this job. Like a good question to ask is, hey, what's when it comes to this job, what's really worrying you? What's keeping you awake at night? What's costing you sleep, Mr. Manager? And when Mr. or Ms. Manager answers that question for you, now you can say something like, well, if you hire me, you're not going to have to worry about that because I've solved that problem before and this is how I've solved it. So in case that doesn't come into the interview questions, you can tell them that if you hire me, I'm going to fix your problem. I'm going to I'm going to help deal with the thing that's got you the worst, you know, the most fear. Or I'm going to help you achieve your biggest ambitions, whatever those are going to be. And that's how you sell. And a, a kind of a step two here is you want to try to understand how expensive those problems are. What happens if that project isn't delivered on time? Does it cost you money? Does it does it is it a disaster? And how expensive is that disaster? So if you're the person who can fix a five million dollar problem, then an extra twenty thousand dollars for you in the pay package seems like a good deal to them. But you almost have to show them you have to connect the dots for them. And this is the place to do it. All right. Discover and use leverage. So. Oops, I think I just lost my presentation. All right. I'll get back to it. There we go. Leverage. So competition is a huge point of leverage. That's why it's important. Number one is so important. If there are three or four companies pursuing you and you've been dropping breadcrumbs throughout the process saying uh, other companies are interested, then somehow they're more interested in people that other companies are pursuing. And there's a psychological point of leverage here. Um, it's There's a psychological principle called mimetic desire. This is This is a concept where we as human beings we want the thing that somebody else has we're competitive so if you have a room that two toddlers in it and the room is full of toys there's 20 or 30 toys in there toddler a picks up a toy which toy does toddler b want all the time 100 percent of the time they don't care about the other 19 toys in the room they want the one toy that the other kid has this follows us for our whole lives. Hiring managers are no different. If there's three companies chasing you and somehow in their mind that makes you more valuable, it makes you more interesting. <laughs> if there's nobody else chasing you, you feel it in your gut and they can feel it too. Uh, it goes back to the old principle of beggars can't be choosers. So if you're not doing Number one on the list. If you're not doing number one on the list, it's really hard to have number seven. But there are other points of leverage too. It could be you discover in the interview process that they have they have a big trade show coming up 
They need somebody who can start and be at that trade show. And if they're, they don't have somebody there, it's going to cost them a lot of money. They've invested in the trade show or the, their whole sales cycle might be set back for a quarter. And you, you might be the only candidate who, who can accept an offer and actually be on board in time for the upcoming trade show. So recognizing when you have leverage and when you don't is very, very important. Just a reminder, you don't have much leverage in the phone screen step. You build leverage over time. All right, so the next thing is delay your acceptance. If you get an offer and you love that offer and you're excited about that offer, don't accept it immediately. <laughs> so here's why. You have the most leverage at any point in this whole process between the time you get an offer and the time you say yes. When they make you an offer, they've selected you, they're extending the offer to you, they want you to say yes. Now, you can withhold your yes in exchange for some stuff. And this is where we're talking about step number four, the counter offer, how to do the counter offer and all that. But you have to recognize they want you to say yes. And so you have a point of leverage here. And if you say yes too fast, you give up all that leverage you have. If you wanted to work from home two days a week, the time to ask for that is right here, not after you said yes. If you want to ask about the severance policy, the time is now not after you say yes. If you have a family vacation planned three months out that you've already paid for, the time to get permission to take that time off is right here, not after you say yes, because once you say yes, you just all your leverage just went away. All right, get off that train. All right, be, last one is be a reliable and open collaborator. And that means you want to try to convert the HR person in the process, the person who's the upfront screener, into your ally along the way. Sometimes we feel like they're our opponent, they're against us, but if, there's, if there are uh, ways that you can convert them into your ally along the way, then... Um, that is extremely helpful. Negotiation does not have to be a duel to the death, a high conflict experience. Um, when, I when I have clients come to me and they ask me for coaching, I'm teaching them how to collaborate through this whole process, not be an ultimatum person, not be the high powered negotiator that everybody hears about where you're taking huge risks by pushing the envelope too far. Um, if you're a collaborator, then you can often win bigger in the negotiation. You can still be nice and get a great outcome in the negotiation. You do not have to be a high conflict jerk <laughs> to get what you need out of this process. All right, so we are now in uh, a, a spot where it's good to ask questions. Um, going to stop the screen share if I can figure out how to do that. And this would be a good time to just ask questions, anything that's on your mind. I'd be happy to, like, I want to leave you guys with a lot of good stuff. So you could come out of this meeting with a new strategy, at least one new idea. Hi, John. My name is Lonnie. I have a question for you. Um, one of the things that I've been uh, seeing more often is specifically in that phone screen or even video these days with the recruiter. Um, they, you know, we've been told in the past to get them to give a range first. Um, and so there are a lot of jobs that either have it posted or the recruiter comes out sharing a range. 
Um, if, I guess how I'm saying this, if it seems like that range is a bit like lower than ideally I would want, like what's the best kind of response in those things? Like, do I stay within the range that they've already shared? Um, or do I have a little leeway at that point to kind of expand out on it? That's a good question. And I think it goes back to one of the things I said earlier is if you have a range of your own and your range overlaps with theirs, like keep in mind what they're trying to do in the phone screen. They're trying to make sure that at the finish line, you're not going to fall apart. Because if there's a recruiter or a phone screen, or even if they're a third party search firm kind of person, the worst thing that can happen, the most embarrassing thing for them is that they won't be able to close you at the end. They tied up all this organizational time, scheduling interviews. They, they spend their influence capital getting people to interview you. So they want to make sure that they'll be able to close you at the end. So I think at this point, the safest thing to do is to respond with your range, make sure it's overlapping. So let's say they say, Oh, the range that we're talking about total compensation is going to be 150 to 185. And your range is 180 to 240. <laughs> and you could say, well, it looks like we have a little bit of overlap. It might be, you know, I think it's going to be possible for us to work something out here. Um, but the range that I'm discussing with other companies is really more in the you know, 170 to, to, to low twos range. And so we might be able to work something out. I'm, I'm confident that if I like the job enough, we will be able to come together on this. And so you have to re reassure them that they're not going to be embarrassed at the end while still bringing a range. You could ask them, you know, if it seems like you're at an impasse, if their range is 150 to 185 and your range is really, 200 and up <laughs> yeah. and it feels like there's a gap here i think this is where you might have the hail mary you're trying to see if there's any reason to think that you should go forward you could ask them if the if i knock it out of the park in the interview process is there any way that we could consider a, a different pay grade or a level up from this position. So if you're interviewing for a manager, could we talk about maybe a senior manager or something like that? If it's director, could it be senior director or VP? Uh, is there any way if I completely knock it out of the park that we could be in this other range that I'm talking about with other companies? By the way, when you say I'm talking about this range with other companies, it gets back into that mimetic desire thing. You just dropped a breadcrumb that you're talking to other companies. They see you as valued in this range. Now, if you go through that and the answer is still no, uh, your ranges are apart. The top of their range is below your walk away number. Then I think you just have to walk away at that point. So I hope I gave you a strategy. Yeah. Uh, Here's another thing I'll say is that recruiters are often intentionally uh, setting conservative expectations early in the process. They're trying to push your expectations down a little bit. And this is exactly why. I've been doing this for so many years. I've seen recruiters make this mistake over and over again. Let's say they set your ex, you, you say, I need 190, and they say, well, that's that's okay. I think we might even be able to do a little bit more than that. Now you're expecting something above 190, maybe 200. And then the offer comes in at 175. <laughs> even if 175 was your wildest dream come true, now you're disappointed and the offer can often fall apart with the candidate. So the other way of doing it is much better for a recruiter. They set your expectation low in this call uh, and along the way they're pushing your expectation down so they can surprise you to the upside with the offer you're more likely to accept if that happens so 
just because a recruiter is talking about a range that seems low doesn't mean that's the actual range some of the time. So that's why it's good to stick with a range. And then you can work your way up that value range as you are interviewing and proving to them how valuable you are. I hope that, uh, does that answer your question? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that was great. Thank you, John. Sure. Kelly has a question. Kelly, can you Kelly. unmute? <clears throat> Hi, thanks, Kathy. Um, so I have this friend and who was really excited a few weeks ago. He's a part of my job search group of other job seekers that I meet with uh, once yep. a week. Uh, he, um, oh, sorry, I'm distracted. It says it's going to lower my hand in three seconds. Um, so he was expecting two offers in one week. One of the offers came through and he was still waiting on the other one. When he got the first offer, he thanked the company for making the offer and said, I'm waiting for an offer from another company. Can I have some time so I can have all the details and make the best choice? Uh -huh. uh, then the next morning, that company rescinded the offer and said, well, we're clearly not your first choice. So we're gonna let you go ahead with that other company. And then the other company didn't make an offer. So, he Ouch. got very gun shy. He got very, oh no, I can't push back at all. I have to accept an offer immediately. I can't negotiate. He got very, very gun shy. So in this market where there are way more of us than there are employers willing to hire us, uh, what, can I, what, what, what strategy would you use and what should I advise my friend? That is, I always like the I'm asking for a friend question. That's <laughs> it, it actually it actually is, but I'm going to apply it to yeah. me. I already put in the Slack thread that I was going to tell him what you said. I actually think this is a question everybody needs the answer to because it happens to everybody at some point. You're if you're keeping your interview pipeline full, if you're doing well with that, and multiple companies are coming at you, you're going to have this mental hierarchy of how how you like you like this job more than this job more than this job, but um, you're going to have to have a job at the end of the day and you might not get your first pick. What happens all the time actually is it seems like this is just the way it's it's written. Your preferred company is scheduling you for round two where some other company that you're not all that interested in is ready to make you an offer. It's a good position to be in, but you have to delay it. Now, your friend you can you can you can approach it that way, but there's a risk associated with approaching it and saying that you've got another offer coming. There's there are a series of delaying tactics, but and I'll give you a few examples of what those are that are fairly safe. It can buy you a few days, maybe up to a week. At the same time, though, you have to be working with the number one company and saying, you know what, I've received another offer from another company. I'd really rather work for you. Is there any way that we can expedite the process? Um, I have to give them an answer by the end of next week at the latest. So if you're interested at all in me, I might be off the table. So you have to simultaneously slow this one down while you're speeding that one up. Does that make sense? And so how do you slow the company down? I think that's a great question. Uh, the first thing you do is, of course, you don't accept the offer immediately. You say this is a big decision. Um, I am grateful for the offer. So he did the right thing there. You thank them for the offer always, all the time. Grateful for the offer. Uh, I'm going to need a few days to discuss with my family. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I think this is a potentially good offer. And uh, but I need to discuss it with my family because these are in my in my circle, this is a family decision. So I'm going to take a couple of days and I'll get back to you in a couple of days. So then you get back to them in a couple of days and you say, I have a few questions about the offer, if you don't mind. And you ask them these questions like at 4.58 p.m. You do it in an email. <laughs> it's going to buy you an extra day or two because it'll take them some time to turn around the questions. So you start asking them questions like, uh, you know, I'm I'm going to be starting in May. What's your annual performance review cycle? Like, when could I expect my first increase? Uh, is the first increase going to be prorated based on my month of hire or not? 
Uh, tell me more about your bonus structure. How is that paid out? Um, when am I eligible for my first vacation? You know, you what's the company contribution to medical insurance? You can, you can, yeah, I mean, you don't want to become annoying with these questions, but you can ask a few questions, wait for the answer, then ask a couple more questions, wait for the answer. And by doing this, you can drag it out a few extra days. But what's really critical, though, is you have to speed that other company up because eventually you'll sense you're reaching the end of their patience. They want an acceptance. Um, you could put together a counter offer, but I think it's a little disingenuous to negotiate with a company you don't really intend to accept the offer from. So be careful with that. I hope that's a useful tip. Very much so. Thank you. Um, I like okay. that. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. I get nervous speaking on Zoom. Yeah. Um, I have a whole video like, on these topics, how to speed things up, how to slow things down in I the like South that. Coach Academy. Got to flail your up. arms. Wave your hand. Wave there your we arms. Go. There you go. If you flail your arms, it might come back on. Yeah. Normally, uh, I don't I, wear I a like jacket anymore, guys. Um, I like the 4.58 p.m. <laughs> and I like the strategies to slow them down while also speeding up the other the other company um and and i need to type this in my note to my friend uh also um not negotiating yeah the offer when you're not yet in good faith and you could say too like there are a few other ideas i'm sure could even come from this group but you could say after you get through some questions you could say would it be possible for me to meet with another person or um, I have a few questions for the hiring manager. Can we schedule a meeting tomorrow? Just to, I, I, I have some things I need to understand about the scope and the challenges and what he would ask, he or she would ask me to do. Okay. So that's another delaying tactic. You just got to be careful, not overplaying that, um, that hand. I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, we um i have two questions i'm looking to see if somebody else had a, a, a question in the in the chat i had two questions and, and one is um we've had a lot of people say never give a range because if you say i you know i can accept this to this that you know a to b that they'll always say okay they'll they'll accept a because yep. you've just told yep. them that uh and so and so can you can you respond to that and then i have another oh, yes. one absolutely uh, and that's, there's a subtle difference between saying, I'll accept between this and this, and other companies are discussing between this and this with me. Oh, so okay. If, if you do it the second way instead of the first way, that's the way to do it. You're not painting yourself into a corner. If they then say, well, if other companies are discussing this so we can be at the bottom of the range they already know that if they're if they're at the bottom of the range they're not competing effectively with the other companies okay all right and you could say <clears throat> easily say no to them they could lose out on a rank we have a question uh any tips uh for how to reveal an upcoming expected childbirth after receiving an offer how to coordinate that with negotiating for compensation. Okay. So if you are expecting a childbirth, whether it's maternity or paternity, and you're going to have to take some time off, is that the question um, that you might lose leverage if that's the situation? I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, Kyle, do you want to speak up? Yeah, that would be part of it. Um, and it, for, in my case, it's going to be very soon. It's early January. So if I get an offer in the next month, I mean, yeah, it's just trying to figure out how to handle the discomfort of like, sorry, I can't get fully onboarded as soon as you have liked. But also, you know, I want to have this conversation about, you know, can we raise my offer up in some way? Yeah. Like, how, to, how to walk that in. That's kind of a sticky one, Kyle. Um, 
I'm going to think about that for a second because normally, normally they can't rescind an offer on this issue. Um, and normally, like if you were, uh, it's a little different when you're talking about paternity or maternity. Yeah. Um, so if you are, uh, if you're a female and you're pregnant, it's a medical condition. They can't discriminate against you based on that. They have to accommodate it, in other words. Now, some state laws may require an accommodation like that for paternity leave. And so if that's the case, then in your state, and I'm not sure what the Texas state law is, I would suggest that you don't even bring it up until you have accepted the offer and you're in the onboarding process. But it can be a little bit of a shock and a surprise to the hiring manager. So I'm yeah, not really about, sure what the I mean, right answer is. Yeah, I worry about kind of giving off a bad first impression if I accept the offer and then say, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know what the right unless is. It, unless it has changed, <laughs> unless it has changed in Texas uh, in the last few years, uh, the the, um, the advice usually is that you wait until the offer is made uh, and even until you're onboarding, till you're there. And then you mention it. Uh, Texas doesn't have many um, protections for things like that. But yeah, you you. you you feel you feel smarmy for not having brought it up sooner. It's the same sort of sticky area if you might have um, a certain kind of disability that's going to require an accommodation or if you have cancer and you need time off to go get cancer treatments or something like that. They are not allowed to ask you or screen out based on that but they are required to accommodate you or provide a reasonable accommodation. Now, I'm not sure. Yeah, paternity, maternity. Yeah, I, I think I'd wait till the offer was extended. And if it blew up in your face, then I don't know, blows up in your face. Maybe you can offer some flexibility, um, something. One company in particular has a generous uh, parental leave policy. And so... I don't think that in that case they would rescind an offer because I'm expecting a child. But I don't think they can rescind the offer. Oh, so sure. the question yeah, is, yeah. like, are you going to burn bridges? <laughs> I think that's the right. somehow you're going to upset a manager who needs you to be there and thought you would be there. Yeah, I think that's probably the core of your concern, right? Yeah, it's like if I'm going to accept an offer, I want to yeah start off on the right foot i don't want to start off you know acting like i was only looking out for myself and not you know working to kind of coordinate like ideally i want to kind of coordinate that paternity yeah. with them and maybe when you're onboarding then you could sit with the manager or call them and say you know there's something i i need to share with you and that is i have an upcoming paternity leave and it's likely to require you know me to be away for a bit i hope i'll be able to work with you to plan for that so that you're not left in the lurch and i'll do everything i can to support you i'm re i'm a little worried frankly that we could get off on the wrong foot and i don't want that to happen so mm -hmm. how can we work together to make sure that um that your needs are are taken care of and i can still have this paternity leave that's important to my family yeah i think that's really good um uh, i had a a person with a, a mental health issue all she needed was was um permission to have a a one-hour doctor's appointment and so she, uh, after they offered her the job she said by the way I'm willing to come in early. I'm I'm willing to work through lunch, but I but once a week I've got this doctor's appointment that is long standing and I have to do it. And they 
withdrew the offer. They said, we need you there. We need you there. And which was a, a, a very closed minded, unrealistic, uh, you know, barrier that they put there. And, and when we called an advocacy group later, they said, we can't help you uh, until you actually get on the job and you request this. And then, uh, and then we can work something out. But uh, when yeah. you, we sending so an to... offer could be based on they could claim they rescinded your offer because something came back in your references that they didn't like or something when the real reason is this thing yeah so, and they were very clear that this was the real reason but anyway it was it, they they were unreasonably close minded about the whole thing but i think what you explained uh to to say i i you know, I, I don't want to start on a, on a bad footing. So let's let's see what we can work out uh, yep. to help you. I think that was really good. Um, I got time for one more question, Kathy. OK, do we have uh, one more question? If not, I'm going to ask mine. But mine is is I, I see good. one in the chat from Sally negotiating work from home. I was responding to uh, the um, maternity paternity. Leave. Oh. I was I just mean. suggesting to offer to work from home part of it. It wouldn't be ideal, but, you know, being new, you would kind of not burn the bridge completely. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. Here's one that says, if I've been a stay at home mom and I have a six year gap in my resume, well, I don't want to lowball myself, but I would like to get back into my old career track. Should I just tell them the lowest salary range they offer, even if it goes against my gut feeling, uh, it might not be super important. Yeah, I would still uh, court multiple companies. You start off with a range that you've researched and then gradually you fill that in from your company discussions. So um, your range can still be the, you know aligned with the lowest thing they offer. But I think the important thing here is you don't want them to peg you at the bottom of their range before they've even interviewed you. So if you if you try to maintain a range until after you've interviewed, even if you've had a six year gap in your resume, if you can hit the ground running, if you can add value, they're not going to care at mm -hmm. that point. So be careful not to lowball yourself by giving a number. Try <clears throat> try to maintain that range as long as you can. Uh, I know you, we're going to let you leave if you have time. I believe you said that you worked with this person that that you were able after after he worked with you to get him an extra was it hundred thousand an extra hundred thousand? Uh, there have been several several good success stories. I actually had a recent one. I almost don't want to talk about this because it's so ridiculous. And a lot of career coaches they say I've been able to do this. I want you guys to understand this is an outlier. It doesn't usually happen, but a senior level technologist in New York City called me when he had an offer. And we'd never worked together before. And he said, John, I've got an offer with another technology company. And this is a guy with a total compensation package of $600,000. So it was, he was starting off at the big a big package. He asked me if there's any way that he could safely probe to get more. And in a 30 minute conversation, he was able to take what he learned from me in 30 minutes. And he came back uh, the next day to say they, they bumped their offer by $30,000. So, and there's a lot of ways you can negotiate. Sometimes it's salary, sometimes it's signing bonus, sometimes it's, you know, bonus structures, relocation assistance, work from home arrangements, title, even budget. <laughs> you can ask for more budget. <laughs>